delighted that Dan Jan from our faculty here in the School of Art could be here with us today and is going to lead us on a tour through her exhibition. Uh, if you don't know, Dan graduated from Ohio State University in 2018 and since then has been very busy, uh, including not just exhibitions, both nationally and internationally, both here in Italy and in China, uh, but also completing artist residencies in China and uh, Vermont. Vermont is quite a Vermont student. Sure, sure, that's the U.S. residency mm -hmm. as well as China, yes. Great, well, so she's been very busy. And of course, for those of you that uh, are her students, I know there's a few of you, uh, you'll be familiar with her teaching methods, but this is a chance for you to ask her questions on the other side of the classroom. Uh, so Dan's going to take us through a tour of her exhibition, and Dan, is it okay if you interrupt you with questions? Yes, yeah. anytime, if, if I'm not being clear, just speak up and I'll call. Okay, yeah, great. Maybe it'll be helpful to dial it down. Okay, I'll try and do that. Yeah. Now with the mask, it's already hard to hear anyone. I always shout in my classroom. And I prepped myself and need a key enough, so just so I don't have the mental space. Um, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, yes, I prepped approximately 15 to 20 minutes talk just so we have time to jump in the conversation or asking questions if there's more curiosity. And I'm not going to move around too much. I will just generally point a few things uh, as the subject comes up. I generally refer to this body of work as landscapes. And landscapes is a driving thing in my work as I find that's the primary metaphor that I can relate to when I navigate space in the United States. The landscape of the United States, now the landscape of Texas. And the landscape as a subject is only true if we acknowledge that there is no such a thing as landscape. What I mean by that is Landscape is charged with our subjective gaze. And I claim that landscape is, a, landscape acquires meaning through memory. We dwell in the landscape, therefore, we can what we define it. So, through this process of reflection and recollection, we, re, we overwrite the original meaning of a landscape while we hope potential for the future memories of a landscape. So painting and a drawing are the means which I rely on to engage in this reflective and reflective process. I'll talk, it's a loaded statement. Um, I'll unpack that a little bit. So to unpack this process, it would be helpful to talk about the process of making and the process of the image choosing a little bit. This is a body of work I call it um, cat art. Um, it's a very westernized making process. We have canonized artists like Matisse in history um, and Picasso, the um, Surrealism are kind of all planned of this process as a primary method to construct the image. So this cat series is hinging on that tradition, but utilize only ashes as the main material. The imagery are constructed in this show primarily only use ashes, exactly like blue. Um, but nothing else. Except that some of the moments there was a little bit transparent paint for corrections. So in this catalog process, I use exact life and through a very tedious process, I construct images that are uh, from personal reference or internet, footage from YouTube, and in this sense, it's a collaboration between me and another digital collage artist 
uh, the primary method is still finding materials that carry the narrative and the political undercurrents that seemingly relate or sometimes not relate with each other and overlay them to make the work. Um, it's important to take note of the format of those work that they are, uh, like what I mentioned, the cutout is a traditional domain of uh, Western art tradition, but the format is very much appropriated from the Chinese where a, a lot of Asian work have the same characteristic of scroll, this ongoing, unrolling, kind of formats that the imagery from one scene leads into another and they continue to reveal itself as a, as a story continues. Um, so this kind of juxtaposition became the primary method where this body of work is conducted. Two of those five works, I think, this one and this one, they are expanding over 10 feet long. That is 10 feet long, this is 24 feet wide and around. And as the viewer sort of like walk along this body of work, especially the height of the uh, displaying shelf, you are only with your frame of looking, you're only encountering one image and one story at a time. By story, I mean a new sense of narrative. And as you continue on those, the previous scene passes your sight frame and the new scene enters. So it became an overlapping experience of fragmented narrative in a continual experience of time. And that's a very important quality that I'm looking for in my work. So the process and the imagery are a parallel to what I'm looking for in the making of the landscape. And this is especially important because um, I think going back to the beginning statement of landscape making as a way for agency, for reflective and the recollective process. Through the making, I'm processing a sense of self that is from a sense of uh, uh, immigrant living or working in the United States and that kind of sense of dislocation and the sense of longing to redefine my environment that could be a relatable landscape is the underlying purpose that drives my work. Um, In this process of making, like what I said, I've got meditative time of cutouts, um, overlays the cultural memory of Asian landscape, of pictorial space that I love, and also it's a spiritual anchor in my practice in general, that meditative negative space. And it's so important for me to continue research and then renew that kind of negative space in Chinese landscape scroll because that kind of openness in my mind invites uh, maybe I don't define it that way uh, invites a kind of like inclusiveness that allows the momentary chaos of every day but still holds it as a continued trajectory that we can relay and uh, be a parallel. So to kind of like have this uh, making of landscape serves as a metaphorical host is what informs those formalizations in my work. Um, so let's look at some of the imagery to see if that makes sense. Maybe I'm just making things up. Um, for instance, this is the work that I started and finished this summer, along with Matt and Neil, my great studio assistants um, <laughs> in the 
middle summer, like 110 degrees outside, and we were closing the, the drawing classrooms, hiding in the corners, and making those tiniest, tedious cat out that are smaller. Each piece are smaller than your fingernails. And to merge into a 24 feet wide panorama, we had great time. I think I should be great. Um, so the imagery, or like what I said, from everywhere, and I never choreographed how this work is going to come out. So believe it or not, it began with an empty space where I am casting that kind of subjective gaze. Um, so the image sort of like evolves organically, come together, and sort of as I am putting the image down and initiating the story, the existing or previous imagery motif also talks back and they inform new stories, just like how we learn every day. In the panorama, you can find the, uh, the separate images, such as crashed airplane right here, um, the inflatable man from Carlot. They are jumping off the cliff in the manner from the classic or oil painting of line leading line. They're jumping off the cliff. So they're inflatable man leading inflatable man jumping off the cliff. And horses that are slided to the top, connected only with their guts, rushing, trying to get somewhere fast. And empty field with um, a burning oil plane. Some people said that it reminded them of the oil well in the landscape of Texas, which is really fitting because this whole landscape, I was thinking the landscape of Texas, overlapping that mountain scape that it was out with. The landscape are almost became layers of transparency that the film and the films of image became overlaying each other. And in the making of this work, I wasn't distinguish what is ancient time or what is modern time. Imagery motif from ancient times, such as among stuka, um, where horses cartridge or like old war scene, or juxtaposed with modern scenes, such as the inflatable man, airplane, a French lantern, etc. I wasn't drawing a distinction of what era things are from, but I am making a mental note of what is the name, this is what is nature. I call, I call those man-made elements containers. Whether it's a graveyard or a swimming pool or castle, um, they're containers of our life, I guess. And in the way I regard them as signifiers of the ongoing struggle between mankind and nature. And I deliberately left the final panel a little bit empty uh, for the hope that maybe it will continue and expand. So in the way the work either informs a new project or it has its ability to keep growing. Um, Someone was asking that why insist on the cutout and what, why insist on making the image only from charcoal dust. Honestly, I, I didn't know what is my reason except that I love that kind of razor sharp edges. Um, how anti-Eastern that is, coming from a tradition that is sumi ink. Um, rice paper, everything is infused. I think I didn't realize until now there was a, a rebellion, but then with that rebellion, I'm finding the landscape again, the motherland to be a very, very Eastern kind of pictorial space again. Um, I realized there is a condition in my student practice, which is to push against that um, sense of alienation and the dislocation and the drive to, 
poor residents of the home and the lobby, both in terms of pictorial space and that pictorial space. Draw inspiration from that kind of mental space and then come back, keep informed the pictorial space. It's a looping process, and through that process, I grow and reclaim the memory of the landscape. So, I welcome any questions. I didn't really walk around a lot. If you have questions for any specific work, I'm happy to go with questions. The sprawl. Yeah. Um, this actually is the first one in this entire space. So, as you can see, and that's the first frame of this entire sprawl. So, that's much more literal if you look at it. I was really just testing out if I can use cutout to render something, um, to build something seeing how a value or dimension. And I start playing with the idea of the After I construct a flower pack, I was like, okay, the next challenge is transparency. Can I find something that's transparent for me? Then I was like, oh, fish, all right, da, da, da. So it was more of like, I really had no agenda, and I was enjoying this pandemic process of setting a desk. I have a virtual date that is doing the same thing on the screen, but we would just lack out three hours, just do minus cash. It was only a retrospective editorial process that became the scroll. And I still don't know if the work is going to end up to be a spread like this or bump into a book. That's why things are have this unfinishedness. I apologize. Um, and many of the motifs you will be able to identify the hub, the fish, you can uh, the PNG file that was really part of the animation. That was very neat that the data guys just come up saying that a run or run them and just the it here. So I also carry this kind of activity sometimes um, working with, with students when they're going to grab the rest of it. So allow that hand to keep moving and giving ideas for the materials. Ultimately, I want to say that um, I was talking a bit earlier about the navigating space in the driving thing, and this is very much still a navigation of the space, and this is a space, it, the condition of the space is that in the lack of water, every imagery here refers to water without the presence of the water, while the animation filled with water, but also with this kind of cut up and removal process. Yeah. Um, in listening to you and looking at your work, you did mention the word container, and how things are contained. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's mentioned when you mentioned the pool, and it's interesting when you talk about the different aspects, because then I'm seeing things I didn't see before. And now watching the video, you can how you talk about the narratives that are shifting from one, again, it's still sort of like a container. Right, right. Is that um, a way, um, I, I want to understand more of that, is any purposeful in containing, but also keeping it flowing, or is it a combination of like different aspects of your um, experiences, depending where, when, and how, that are being contained and that are constantly shifting? Because I see that in the videos. Um. To answer your question, I think I think again it returns to this both the condition and the desire of navigating through the space. Um, and I think that is the condition that I consciously or subconsciously it's always a subject of mind. Again, going back to be someone who's um, as an immigrant here, like that navigating a space is quite common, both mentally, culturally, 
And literally, it was, for instance, the, the recent um, storm passing by the East Coast and my mom's basement apartment, not, not apartment that, not her basement apartment, it's her apartment located in the basement mm -hmm. that is underground was among all those that flooded up to like the height of the and every single room. Um, and she considered herself lucky because there was 12 Chinese who were killed in a similar living condition, trapped because there's no window and the pressure of the flood water holds the door so you can't escape. Um, that's why I meant that navigation of space is quite vertical and in many other senses. And in search of a formal representation of those concerns, water moving through what is containable and what is not containable, and also uh, just in, in both Eastern and also my personal vocabulary, water is kind of metaphor too, that became what I process those things, mm. feelings and um, events. So it is important that the work have this reflective work can be drawn as an analogy where I can keep pulling reference and knowing where to go on the research. So, does that answer your question? It does. I mean, I, it's, there's also a sense of vulnerability that I see in all of these. And yeah. That is more like there's strength there, right? More I would say, the more dangerous and more right. powerful way. And, and uh, so. since you were mentioning, it's actually important to point out that even though there are containers, you will notice there's macro grounding. Mm -hmm. So the bass path goes into the center of the earth, so it's the same as a castle. The only thing that upholded something perhaps is the swimming pool. So there's a container, but they're really not capable of containing when they're not grounded. And it's funny that I don't know any of this before. I made the work. It's kind of like, <laughs> it's I'm like, okay, I'm going to see the artist. <laughs> so I start writing down what is really behind some of my impulsive decision, and I felt like I can stand behind some of those statements, and some of them I'm not sure. Can you talk about the choice to do black and white work? Because most of your work has been color and then also um, the inclusion of animation because that seems like a new uh, avenue for your body of work. Um, the elimination of the color was sort of like a simplifying one more variables so I can be a bit more focused on learning what I'm going for. I felt like my painting was a little bit too on self-conscious in a way that I I don't know who would mark out the great painter in my practice that I would consider a role model. Like I don't have a very supportive kind of uh, historical art virtual system in the oil painting transition. I feel like again this kind of search of belonging in my oil practice was kind of worn out through a, a year of painting that was 2020. Um, so eliminating color and convert it to a process that I'm not so familiar with is sort of like a departure in, in my painting. Mm -hmm. Kind of like shed away of being a painter when it comes to being a painter. And just commit to drawing because drawing has this very immediate uh, planet, planet Characteristic that allowed me to have much more direct dialogue with pictorial space. Yeah, and I don't know if you talked about it, but can you um, talk about the process of applying the charcoal? It's powdered charcoal? Yeah, charcoal dust. Are using your hand or use brushes? Or... Um, all kinds of them. I use charcoal dust on tracing paper sometimes to just have worry light gray like this, I just shake them, then that's, that's the wall I'm kind of fixing. And sometimes in order to create a dense black, I have to fix it, then add more and then fix it, build it up. Um, depends on the need for the value and texture. 
At the same time, I take note of what kind of organic texture that it takes, like this one. Sometimes it piles up and it passes it off and it becomes kind of like a, almost like a starry light sky. I keep it and just when I when you have enough of a vocabulary, you can pick and choose which is to serve what purpose. But it was all through this kind of trees and paper and, and truffle dust. Some of those images I mixed a little bit with ash that my husband gave to me from my fire pit and I like the poetic of it, but it has this kind of like yellowish tone that doesn't always work. Um, I use some of them just so I can say ashes are <laughs> for out to plan the poetry. That's all. Yeah. So it sounds like you're doing like making material to then cut out. Right, right, um, yeah. yeah. Then like, cutting out the fish and then creating. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. It's actually quite a simple process. And then, um, it's almost impossible to look bad, but it takes a while to get good and to work faster. Yeah. Yeah. And time is really Thanks 
for being here. I appreciate it. This time the audience is much better than I'm staring at the computer.